With that, I want to introduce our first two speakers, and I'm on time, so yay me. Um, the first speaker is going to be Dr. Elaine Worrell, and she's really going to give us uh, a synopsis of our natural history, what we know about LGS right now. And then um, there was no better person to give this talk um, uh, than Elaine. She's just, she's just fabulous. Um, and then Dr. Wheelis is going to come up, and he's going to give us an update on current medical treatments. Um, and then from there, we're going to have a break, and then we're going to jump back in with some, some really good information about deep brain stimulation, looking at DBS, looking at RNS, looking at uh, the PCORI study, comparing VNS to the next, um, or comparing brain surgery to the next drug. And then also Taylor Abel is going to talk about his work with VNS versus CC. So it's really exciting. We'll hope you stay. With that, I'm going to invite Dr. Worrell up. Let's give her applause, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tracy, for the kind invitation. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we know about the natural history um, and what we need to learn. So we're going to review, first of all, the core clinical criteria. Um, we will then look at how, um, or the question, how epilepsy might evolve to lennox gastaut syndrome, and then importantly, how lennox gastaut syndrome evolves with time, because again, it's not a static disease either. We will look at the long-term outcome with regards to both seizure types and seizure control, as well as the comorbidities, and then ask the question, can we actually impact outcome? So we know here um, the definition for lennox gesto, and this has come out through um, work with Samir Zuberi and a number of my colleagues on the Nosology Task Force. Um, and we identified the following criteria for lennox gesto, and the ones that are bolded here are mandatory criteria. So lennox gastaut needs to come on before 18 years, but in reality, it usually starts before eight years. You have to have tonic seizures as a mandatory component, and then at least one other seizure type. And many of our LGS patients have lots of other seizure types. The EEG has to show two clear criteria, one generalized slow spike wave that's less than 2.5 hertz, and that's something that does not always stay through the whole age range, but um, you can get that, that information historically. So sometimes by adulthood, that pattern is gone. And then generalized paroxysmal fast activity, and that is very characteristically seen on sleep EEG. And as we know, um, there's lots of different etiologies. This is not a you know, pure um, uh, entity. And so here is showing the very characteristic generalized slow spike wave, less than 2.5 hertz, and then the generalized paroxysmal fast activity, which often is correlated with tonic seizures. In addition, lennox gesto is associated with mild to profound intellectual disability, and many times that actually precedes onset of seizures, but with seizures, and particularly with worsening seizures, we often see a plateauing or even potentially a regression. And most persons by the time of adulthood have more severe to profound intellectual disability. It is a lifelong and drug-resistant epilepsy, so as Tracy says, it really doesn't leave, um, you know, you're, you're really focusing on this your entire life. And then other comorbidities, including behavior, gait problems, feeding problems, sleep problems, very common. So we'll talk a little bit, first of all, about epilepsy evolution to lennox gesto syndrome. And I think this is a case that any of you who are child neurologists probably have several in your practice as well, but this is a 31-month-old boy who had hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy at birth, had some transient neonatal seizures, and then at six months, he was found to have infantile spasms and was treated with oral steroid. He responded briefly, but then relapsed, and um, his spasms have remained refractory despite further hormonal therapies, vigabatrin, ketogenic diet, et cetera. And over time now, between sort of a year and, um, and uh, uh, two and a half years, his seizures clearly have evolved. So the spasms are less commonly occurring in clusters. The events are lasting longer and resembling more tonic seizures. And now the EEG is evolving also from a hypsarrhythmia pattern to a slow spike wave pattern. So looking at when uh, are some of the challenges we have in the early diagnosis, um, the full complement of the clinical and EEG features that I've just discussed that are mandatory to make this diagnosis are typically absent early on in the course, and they do take time to appear. Ann Berg did a nice study, and she found that lennox gesto actually accounted for about 13% of infantile onset epilepsies, but in most cases it evolved from another syndrome. 
And the time to evolution is 1.9 years. And so this is very challenging for us as clinicians. We often see that a patient is heading towards that direction, but you can't actually call it Lennox Gesto yet. And, and even if we could, you know, what do we do about it? How do we prevent that? So can we predict who's going to evolve? And Dr. Shrey hopefully will be um, sharing some information on that. And can we intervene to halt this process? And if so, how can we do that? I think that's really the big question. So there's lots of unknowns about evolution to lennox gastro syndrome. So first of all, LGS is really due to multiple different causes, right? It can be genetic or structural or metabolic. But all of those causes seem to come in at a critical time in brain development. And, and result in this syndrome. And how does that happen? We still don't know. We also know that um, similar causes can result in one person developing lennox gastro syndrome and in another person a completely different phenotype of epilepsy. And a good example there is tuberous sclerosis complex where some children can go to infantile spasms and LGS and other children can have focal seizures which may or may not be controllable with medication. And so why is that? It's the same etiology. How is, how is that acting? And then can we prevent this evolution? Big question. And um, I think Erin is here. They've done some very nice work in Australia looking at networks. And they found that in LGS, there's actually a disruption of two types of networks. So first of all, we have the attention networks. The attention networks um, allow us, they, they activate when we're trying to focus our attention on something. And they allow us to pay attention to something and actually learn. And then you have the default mode network, and that activates when the person is awake but really unfocused, sort of, you know, your quiet, daydreaming kind of time. And generally, if the attention networks are active, the default mode is not, and vice versa. In LGS, um, the Australian group found that the generalized paroxysmal fast activity actually leads to co-activation of both the attention and the default mode networks, so they're activated at the same time. And slow spike wave also simultaneously um, uh, activated those, but that was a bit more complex. And so that really leads to um, breakdown in normal brain networks. And so, you know, you can understand how that's going to have a significant impact on learning if you're trying to focus on something, yet you're really, not un you're, you're really unfocused. So how do you actually learn if that's happening? There was an interesting um, uh, paper that they had. They looked at one child who had lennox gastro syndrome that was secondary to a focal cortical dysplasia in the left temporal region. And so that child actually ended up having a successful resective epilepsy surgery. And they compared what was happening in the, the networks, the functional MRI, before and after the surgery and compared them to other uh, children with LGS who did not have surgery. And you can see here, first of all, in the see if this works. The uh, non-operated, maybe it doesn't work. I can use my mouse. Okay, here we are. The non-operated LGS kids and the child um, pre-surgically looked pretty much the same. Um, in the post-surgical, what we see on this um, uh, seated functional connectivity matrices is that there's a lot more within network connectivity, a much stronger within network connectivity. And there's also a much more extensive pattern of a negative between network um, uh, connectivity. So these kids had a much more focused networks, um, much more keeping in, in the normal um, uh, range. So early effective surgery was actually, actually able to prevent this very abnormal network formation. But again, probably this needs to be done pretty early. I would be concerned that if you know somebody who had Lennox Gesto was now 20 years of age and now we did the surgery, we are probably not going to see as much benefit. So how about anti-seizure medications? What do we know about their ability to prevent things? Um, and I think most of you are aware of the EpiStop study that was done recently. Now that's specifically Lennox, or specifically tuberous sclerosis complex. But this was 94 infants with tuberous sclerosis. They were diagnosed before um, uh, they had onset of seizures, and they were followed by periodic EEG. And what they did is they started some of those infants um, preventatively, so as soon as they saw epileptiform discharge on the EEG, but before actual seizure onset. And then another group of those kids was treated conventionally, so they only started on Vigabatrin after seizures began. And then they looked at these kids at 24 months. And what they found was if you treated preventatively, i.e. as soon as that uh, child showed evidence of epileptiform discharge on, um, on EEG, 
You had a decreased drug-resistant epilepsy that was uh, statistically significant. Now, they didn't even look specifically at evolution to Lennox Gesto, but those children had less uh, drug-resistant epilepsy. They had significantly decreased infantile spasms. In fact, those who were treated preventively didn't develop spasms. Um, and they also had a trend towards improved outcome developmentally, but that was not statistically significant. We are going to be seeing the results of the PREVENT trial, hopefully, and uh, that is also looking at, at uh, similar um, aspects, particularly the neurodevelopment, so really excited about that. But the exciting thing here is that if we um, treat early, we can perhaps prevent some of this um, very bad uh, drug-resistant epilepsy nastiness. And so this works in tuberous sclerosis. It would be really great if we could identify something that we could intervene early in lennox gesto as that child, you know, once you know that that child is likely going to progress to LGS, something that we could do to intervene to stop that progression. So we'll talk a little bit about evolution of lennox gesto with age. And so first of all, looking at seizures and how do seizures evolve with age. Typically, we see the number of seizure types decrease over time, but um, as uh, Tracy had already mentioned, our kids continue to have very, very frequent seizures. Um, oftentimes, the daytime seizures, the tonic, the atonic, and the absences can reduce, but generally, the nocturnal tonic seizures persist. And that's shown here in this um, upward diagram here. So this is looking, um, it's a Ferlazzo study from, from Italy, and they looked at um, what were the seizures at onset versus last follow-up in adulthood. And the um, yellow were the tonic seizures during wakefulness, the purple are the ones during sleep. And you can see here in adulthood, they're having less tonic seizures during um, wakefulness, but they're still having a lot of tonic seizures during sleep. And then this bottom one is looking at the different types of seizures. So the atonic seizures, you see that those uh, significantly drop in adulthood. The adulthood is the red, the, um, uh, the onset is the blue. So we see a reduction in atonic seizures, a reduction in atypical absences, um, a reduction in myoclonic seizures, but no real significant difference in generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and if anything, maybe a bit of an increase in focal seizures. Looking at the EEG evolution, um, we often see a reduction or even a disappearance of the uh, slow spike wave over time. However, the generalized paroxysmal fast activity uh, generally continues and it persists both in teens and adults, but oftentimes does require a sleep EEG to, uh, to be uh, recorded. And then over time, we do see more multifocal independent spikes as well as the person ages. Looking at, um, uh, at development um, and developmental impairment, about 80% of patients will have actually a decline in their IQ by over 15 points over time. And so by adulthood, usually that equates to at least a moderate to, or severe or even profound intellectual disability. We often see hyperactivity, aggression, and autistic traits. These behaviors often worsen in, a, in adolescence, and uh, particularly the aggressive behavior can be very, very impactful on, on quality of life for both the child and their family. And then other issues, sleep di um, disruption, gait, and gait deteriorates in about 15 to 20% of patients with lennox gesto um, Feeding issues often become more prominent, and some adults who, who were able to, to feed earlier in life as they become adults actually need feeding tubes. So it's not only the seizures, um, but it's really sort of a worsening in their development as, as well as many other comorbidities. So can we actually impact long-term outcome? Um, and I think, you know, the nice thing about some of the newer drug studies we're seeing is they're really focusing on not only just seizure outcomes, but they're focusing on cognition and alertness and other non-seizure outcomes. And we know that um, certain medications in, in Lennox Gesto, right, we have a lot of medicines that have some benefit, and Dr. Willis is going to be sharing that with us. But I don't think we have had any medicine that's really a home run. Like, I think in Dravet, we have some that we're super excited about because they're much more effective in, in LGS, we just haven't gotten there. And I think most of our medications as well have minimal um, impact on quality of life, behavior, and cognition as well. But again, data is pretty limited. Um, this is data from a pharma-grade um, uh, epidiolex study. It's an open-label extension study um, of uh, 366 patients treated for a median of 1,090 days. And in this study, they actually asked caregivers to rate um, the global impression of change, and they looked at whether that was worse, um, the same, or better. And um, you can see here with um, uh, uh, epidiolex treatment, 
um, many of the, the families um, rated you know, improved. And this is sort of the darker line here. These are our patient, patients who said that the, uh, their loved one had an improved quality of life or improved um, global impression of change um, compared to before the, the EpiDialex was started. I think interestingly, this um, study also did collect Vineland data and that was not reported here. And so I think that would be really interesting data um, if we are able to, to see that as to how much they actually improved. This is another study. This was a prospective open-label study of um, LGS and Dravet patients um, starting on cannabidiol. And in this study, they assessed baseline and six-month outcomes. They used a Korean version of the quality of life and childhood epilepsy in the child behavior checklist, and they found no significant changes in, in either of those measures. Well, how about modu neuromodulation? Um, and so this was published um, uh, earlier this year by the Australian group. This is the Estelle trial. So they had 19 adults, and this was done only in adults with LGS treated with deep brain stimulation. They had a, a period of blinded stimulation and then an unblinded stimulation period, 12 weeks each. They measured cognition and behavior at baseline and then the end of the blinded period and then at the end of the unblinded period. And they were able to show that there was improved epilepsy severity, there was decreased disability, However, they did not see any change in cognitive function, adaptive behavior, or quality of life. And again, you know, maybe this was done too late, right? Maybe, you know, if we had looked at children who were four years old instead of adults who had had a lifetime of LGS, would that outcome be different? Um, and I think that, that those studies need to be done. So to conclude, LGS is a severe childhood onset and drug-resistant epilepsy. Um, it typically takes months to at least several years to really evolve into the full clinical picture so that we as clinicians can say, yes, they tick all the boxes and they have Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. There does appear to be disruption in neuronal networks um, uh, from, and, and these uh, neuronal networks also probably predispose to both seizures and neurodevelopmental comorbidities. I think we still don't understand um, why do certain etiologies result in LGS in one patient and in a different epilepsy phenotype in another? And I think the most important question is, you know, once we know that a patient is kind of evolving towards LGS, what can we do to disrupt this? There's a very small number of kids who are going to have a surgically remediable lesion that we can actually go in and resect. Most of the kids, that's unfortunately not an option for. And so what can we do? What, is there any medications? Is there any therapies, any type of neuromodulation that can be helpful? And I think that really is um, uh, something that we need to focus on in order to improve outcomes. So once established, we know LGS does evolve with time. Seizures remain drug resistant, although there is a little bit of change in semiology. We also see um, uh, worsening in many other aspects, so cognition, gait, feeding, um, and why is it that those, those, um, ch those patients worsen over time? And we have medicines that lessen the seizure burden um, modestly, I would say. We don't have any real winners. Um, and none of them, I think, have a really significant impact on other comorbidities. Um, and so, you know, the other question is, what is the impact of underlying cause on best therapy? If somebody has a certain cause, are they more likely, and should we be treating them earlier with a different type of therapy? Other than people with a surgically uh, remediable lesion, I don't think we have that. Um, and then I think we are going to need disease-modifying therapies that target the underlying cause, and this is going to be likely really targeting small subgroups of kids with LGS. So with that, happy to take a question, one question. <laughs> and yeah. Do you think that if they looked longer than 12 weeks out in the adult study that they might see something? Because I know that like, with my doctor, you know, it was a tiny, tiny little but it took a really long time. Yeah, I think for the cognitive stuff and behavior stuff, oftentimes you may need to follow longer than that. But I, I think also, treating, you know, really targeting adults after a lifetime of, of LGS, we probably need to look at that earlier. A good question. All right. Thank you.